Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. A warm welcome to everyone to this side event on achieving equal pay for women and men. This side event is co-organized by the UN Global Compact together with the EPIC, the Equal Coalition on International the, the Equal Pay International Coalition. This coalition is led by the ILO, the International Labour Organization, UN Women, and the OECD. It's also known as EPIC. Now, this initiative is driven by stakeholders committed to reduce the gender pay gap and make equal pay for work of equal value a reality in all countries and in all sectors. Now, this is very needed because we see that across the globe, women are still earning less than men for the same jobs. Now, equal pay for women is a first step to achieving full gender equality. Now, UN Global Compact is a proud member of EPIC because in the Global Compact, um, equal pay and, and equal pay for equal work is also integral to the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact. And on more than 12,000 participating companies are committed to reduce and eliminate discrimination in payment uh, for the same employment and occupation. So <coughs> UN Global Compact is a very proud member of EPIC and I'm very pleased to welcome today our four distinguished speakers. First of all, we have uh, Lisa Wong from the EPIC Secretariat. She will moderate the session. And I'm also joined by our colleagues from IKEA and Novartis, two companies that are also member of UN Global Compact, but also participant of EPIC. And they will learn us a bit more because in this session, we want to give you an opportunity to learn about EPIC, what EPIC means for companies and how it can help them in closing the gender pay gap. And last but not least, I'm also joined by our colleague from the International Organization for Employers, Maria, and she will also give us some insights about how EPIC, what EPIC means for the, the employers organization and how they contribute to uh, the work of EPIC. Without further ado, I want to give the floor now to Lisa, who will be moderating the session. Lisa is our colleague from the ILO and also part of the EPIC Secretariat. Lisa, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Greet. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon, representing the EPIC Secretariat. Before we be begin our panel discussion, I'd like to briefly introduce our viewers to the Equal Pay International Coalition, or EPIC. EPIC is currently the only multi-stakeholder partnership working to reduce the gender pay gap and to achieve equal pay for work of equal value at the global, regional, and national levels. EPIC was established in September 2017 and currently comprises 48 members, 11 of which joined only last year in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Since then, the EPIC Secretariat has been approached by 11 other potential members, including three private sector companies. EPIC is governed by a steering committee comprising eight governments representing different regions of the world, the International Trade Union Confederation and the International Organization of Employers. The day-to-day -day operations of EPIC are ensured by the EPIC Secretariat, that's the ILO, UN Women and the OECD. As a key member of the EPIC Secretariat, I could go on for hours about EPIC's mandate, its achievements and plans, but we've developed a video, which I think explains this much better than I have ever could. So let's all have a look. Gender pay gaps stubbornly persist. At present across the world, women earn around 20% less than men on average per month. One of the most effective ways to reduce the gender pay gap is to promote equal pay for work of equal value, as provided for under the Sustainable Development Goals, specifically 5 and 8.5 of the 2030 Agenda. Reducing the gender pay gap is not impossible. All over the world, countries, companies and workers are pioneering new and innovative solutions. Legislation providing the right to equal pay for work of equal value. Requiring companies to publish their gender pay gap data publicly. There are free online pay calculators and other tools which determine the portion of discrimination of the gender pay gap. Companies that apply equal pay can be certified. Minimum wage policies and collective bargaining agreements that include equal pay clauses. 
What is clear is that no one size solution can fit all, and that no single actor can solve the challenge of equal pay alone. The Equal Pay International Coalition, IPIC, is a collective effort to accelerate progress in closing the gender pay gap by 2030. Governments, companies, civil society, academia, employers and workers' organizations can join and contribute to making a change. EPIC provides a platform for peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, knowledge sharing of data and tools. It encourages countries to adopt progressive policies towards gender equality, thus reducing the pay gap. Bring your expertise, knowledge, commitment and make a change towards societies that value women and men's work equally. Learn more about EPIC and sign up to be part of the solution. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, EPIC in a nutshell. So let's turn to our panelists. Joining me today, there are three EPIC members. First of all, representing the employers organization and the private sector. Let me start by introducing Maria Paz, who is the director for ILO coordination at the International Organization of Employers, the IOE. The IOE sits on the EPIC steering committee. Thank you for joining us, Maria. Thank you very much. Also joining us is Marcus Priest, the global reward leader at Novartis. Novartis is a global healthcare company based in Switzerland. A warm welcome to you, Marcus. Thank you, Lisa. And last but not least, we also have Peter List, the global head of equality, diversity and inclusion at the Inga Group, which represents or is a holding company for IKEA. He's with us. I think we're all familiar with IKEA Furniture, and it's great to have you with us, Peter. Thank you. Peter, I'd like to start with you. IKEA was one of the first multinationals to join EPIC. Why was this? Tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that IKEA has been facing in its journey towards equal pay for its workforce. Over to Thanks, you. Lisa. You know, there are many challenges, but maybe I'll try and focus on um, the key four, four. Our first challenge was really about choosing the right methodology. And um, I think this is something that any global company will face. We know we want a common global approach to gathering, measuring and analyzing data, but what methodology to use? Do we go with the existing, create one of our own? In the end, we did a bit of both. And the way we started the work with Gender Equal Pay globally was we brought together a working group of 10 countries. And the goal was to explore those methodologies and ways of working to really co-create our common Inca framework. And this collaborative work actually helped us develop a framework that worked across all our markets. And it also is making it easier for us to roll out because it was truly co-created and not something that was steered top down. So that was the first challenge. The second challenge we faced was ensuring comparable data. Doing this work for over 160,000 people means you are dealing with huge data sets. Currently, we collect data from several sources and um, that all support coworker development. So we use an app that we built in Power BI and Business Analytics to really aggregate and analyze this data and view different data cuts and track those key figures and status of the actions. And we use different data points like country, pay policy, business, unit, function, position, the International Position Evaluation IP by Mercer that we use, the pay rate, the gender, competence rating, performance rating. So just getting these figures is a real challenge. But what adds to the complexity is the fact that we're sourcing the data from 30 different countries, all with different pay policies. And we needed to make sure that this data coming in was comparable so we could draw the right conclusions. So the one reason we've put a lot of effort into verifying our data, both through internal and external audits. The third challenge actually was the toughest, keeping leaders engaged. Now, for a purpose-led organization like IKEA, getting people to agree for the need of equal pay, of work of equal value is quite easy because equality and fairness runs deep through our culture and values. But keeping them engaged and comfortable with the topic is more difficult because, as we all know, it's not easy and it's not quick. If it was, we wouldn't be here. So when you get down to it, gender equal pay is a technical topic that requires time and patience, both to understand and to implement. 
And what we found is that even with stakeholders who feel it's the right thing to do, they don't always understand the detailed changes that need to be made or the facts that structural changes, which is ultimately what we're after can take years. But it is critical that these stakeholders stay engaged across the business. It's not just the responsibility of human resources. It's a job and a journey for everyone in the company. It requires the personal commitment and vigilance of the CEO and management board level. And it, we require our country managements to report annually on the status of gender equal pay before the country boards and working continuously to maintain good data. So it's part of our business plan that really is put forth by each country. And then the fourth one is really about how we ensure equitable business practice in an unequal world. You know, businesses don't operate in isolation from the societies that we're in at IKEA. So uprooting deep-seated gender inequalities is a major project of systemic change. And although we're doing our best within our sphere of influence, inequities in the outside world can and still do seep into IKEA. And we are prone to biases that are rife in society and we're still impacted by gender inequalities when it comes to achieving gender balance. So that's why we are adamant that gender equal pay is not only a pay topic, Pay comes at the end of many processes that in turn influenced by people and society. In our approach, we look into the contributing factors for pay gaps and try to prevent the gaps before they start. And that leads to its own complexities of interdependencies. So we work closely with talent and development to really ensure gender balance and succession planning with our recruitment teams, where we co-create the salary offer process. And then we ensure that all recruiters and managers receive unconscious bias and equal pay training. Now, I know that's a lot, but those are the four key challenges that IKEA faced. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that, Peter. Uh, Marcus, over to you. I'm not sure if Novartis faces similar or different challenges, but I think it would our viewers might be uh, interested in learning why Novartis chose to engage with Epic and how this engagement has been helping you at Novartis overcome your own challenges. Thank you, over to you. Yeah, no, and, and I think many of the things Peter raised, I can certainly resonate with. And um, I think for us at Novartis with Epic, um, the number one thing it did for us, uh, because we started our partnership with Epic back in 2018. And at the time we, we were doing lots of things internally, uh, but we weren't quite sure exactly what to do to really address uh, equal pay for equal work and the, and the gender pay gap. Um, and what Epic enabled us to do, I think, was to give the organization some focus. So, um, you know, internally, it's really helped to drive uh, sponsorship, I would say. Um, and, and I think with the input from, from the coalition, it helped us to maybe jump ahead to, to, to create, you know, we actually have internally what we refer to as our Epic Pledge. So we steal the name, I'm, I'm sure hopefully that's okay, but we steal that reference to the coalition because it, it's obviously, it's a bigger community outside of Novartis. But through that Epic Pledge, we've made very specific commitments. And I think those commitments we wouldn't have made, I don't think without the partnership with Epic uh, and the value that that brought to a number of our senior stakeholders. Yes, yeah, so we we're very fortunate to have strong sponsorship at the executive level and the board level. And I think increasingly now, the partnership also brings with it a level of uh, a, a positive impact from an external perspective as well. It demonstrates our commitment as a company, not only to you know, this, these efforts, but also the fact that we're kind of contributing to that bigger, that bigger kind of social uh, situation. So, so for us initially, it, it's very much a, you know, have a building partnership, you know, driving that sponsorship internally. And then, as I said, you know, resonate a lot with what Peter referenced, um, but what we're particularly proud of at Novartis is that we, we didn't wait for Novartis to, to come to the conclusions and all the answers to then put our plans in place. So we made very concrete commitments around what everyone around us was telling us, you know, not just in Novartis, but externally. So, you know, What's interesting, some of the legislation that we're starting to hear now, you know, in the EU and our other places, that's effectively what our commitments are. So stopping looking at historical salary and our offer process is one of our commitments. Giving associates pay transparency. These are all things which we made these commitments on the basis of what we were hearing from our, our coalition partners. So it was a really valuable input. And I think 
from a, a reward leader's perspective, uh, although we had lots of strong arguments to have that external perspective as well, again, really helps from a sponsorship perspective. Um, so that's, that's really what I would kind of highlight as the, the immediate uh, value um, for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus, for sharing. I actually have very fond memories of sitting with some of your colleagues in New York as you were preparing for that epic pledge at the uh, pledging event that we had. And, that, and you, Novartis at that time wasn't even a member of Epic, but still came out and made that epic pledge. Well done. Maria. The IOE is the largest um, of the private, the lar is the largest network of private sector organizations in the world, representing more than 150 businesses and employers organizations, some of which are Epic members. Mm -hmm. Tell us, what are employers organizations doing to promote Epic within their membership? Sure. Let me start, Lisa, by thanking you uh, uh, in the name of Epic and, and Griette on the UN Global Compact side for this opportunity. Um, I am delighted to join this conversation to learn about what other private sector initiatives, in this case, uh, Peter from IKEA and Marcus from Novartis, and also to share what the IOE and our members are doing to move the needle on equal pay for work of equal value. Uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, IOE is a member of the EPIC steering committee that drives the work of EPIC, as well as a member of the UN Global Compact Target Gender Equality Program. Our commitment to addressing this issue spans then from international to grassroots levels. Many of our 150 member organizations in over 145 countries are fully participating in policy dialogues and reforms in this area to ensure that men and women are paid on an equal footing and women's work are valued equally to men's work. Employer organization also provide support and advice on a daily basis to their member companies so that their organizational cultures, policies, and practices respect this principle of equality and inclusivity. For example, both the French employer organizations and the Canadian are just to name a few, are deeply engaged in national debates to shape realistic local initiatives and they have done so since the very er early stages. And I think that's something important to highlight as well. But we all understand that more needs to be done. And Peter, I like when you referred to, it is not easy and it is not quick. And that's why we are here talking about this important subject. I think uh, we all recognize that more needs to be done. And in that sense, I would like to share with you what I consider to be the five most important points when it comes to tackling discrimination in pay. First, governments must involve employer organization uh, as they offer the collective voice of employers and play a key role in helping implement state policies. Second, if I may, uh, I think that policies must be simple, practical, realistic, coherent, and differentiated for all type of businesses, large, medium, and small. Policies must also consider national circumstances and capacities. There is clearly no one size fits all approach. The third recommendation I would like to share with you in this conversation today is that policies must provide an environment to thrive and grow for women entrepreneurs and the female in the workforce. This includes providing access to basic education, economic opportunities, credit, training, skilling opportunities, and career development. Bar barriers must be reviewed and to the maximum extent minimized. This obviously requires tripartite cooperation and support from other stakeholders. Fourth, uh, I believe we cannot underestimate the power of strong networks and partnerships. Peter and Marcus, you somehow highlight this in your presentations. It is the mandate of the international initiatives which we are part and uh, partner with that can make a difference at the national and local level. And this is why we, the IOE, uh, we are part of both initiatives, EPIC and the UN Global Compact Tiger Gender Equality. We strive to bring together these international networks with our local networks to shape dialogues for real change. 
We are also increasingly uh, uh, working on sharing awareness and increasing awareness with our global networks on the challenges, but also on the opportunities and the policy recommendations in this space. To conclude, my fifth recommendation is to highlight that we need to do more and we need to do more together because together we are stronger and together we can make a real impact. Thank you, Lisa, for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Maria, for that intervention. Excellent. Um, I think we might just have one minute left and if we can have one finalist, Peter, Mark, um, Peter in one sentence, just one, why should other companies join Epic? I think our Epic membership has been helpful in helping us feel secure about our process quality, and we've benefited from ILO expertise and scrutiny throughout our process. So there's so much sharing and learning um, from the ILO, but also other members, and it's invaluable to hear from other companies like Novartis. So I think that we can all do great work in our separate spheres, but lasting societal change demands a group effort. Great, thank you. And Peter, I mean, Marcus, sorry, you, the last word, same question. Why should other companies join Epic? One sentence. So I would say uh, you're joining a global community with a common goal. And I think that's the best part about it. And it's, it's the diversity of the group. So all of the reward leaders, the DNI leaders out there will have their reward and DNI networks. But this is an opportunity to come together with governments, uh, with international organizations. So it's, yeah, it's very unique in, the, in that setting. Excellent, thank you. So thanks to you, Peter. Thanks to you, Marcus. Thanks to you, Maria, for sharing your stories, your experiences, your advice. Great. Thanks to you and the Global Compact for, for organizing this, this session, this event, and allowing us uh, to share. Uh, as EPIC, we look forward to hearing from some more UN Global Compact members. Let them know, please, that you can all reach out to us via email at epic at ILO.org or through Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook at EPIC 2020. 2030, sorry, 2030. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Lovely. Bye-bye.